All right, we're back to part two of objects. Yeah, so uh, what we just do in a few minutes is to show how we can put all this together to, to process values from a text file. To you gotta make a share nicer, your screen again. Yeah, I'll do it. To okay. make a nicer uh, presentation. So again, it is to start from this CSV file, which is in fact a tab delimited file with uh, five values for each six values on each line to put it together, to group this by album, and then to sort it by year. So we have here all the discography of the Beatles from 1963 to 1970 at the end here. So how we do that? First, we will create an associative array of albums. So in this array, we will have the title of the album as being the key, as being the index to access each album. And we have a second uh, array with uh, associative array by year. So we will have album by year. So that's the way we'll be able to sort it here by, by year in the end. So we will read the text file here one line at a time. And for each line, we will search, we will first use the split command that we've seen a minute ago uh, with the line that we are reading from the file that is delimited by tab. And it will return a simple array for one song. So it will return as we see the first example here, it will return a day in the life, Sergeant Pepper, 13, 337, which is the number of seconds and the year. We will use, put each of these item, one, two, three, four, five, it will in, inside different properties of a song, name, album, track, duration, year. And if we take a look at what we get here. So first we get a line here and a simple array one to five with these values. And we process these values to put it in a record, which is a song. And then we have song, album, duration, name, track, and year as a key to access these values here. Okay, I'll just stop it here. So, in this loop here, we have albums that are sorted by song title. So the album, Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Heart Club Band, we have one ear, we'll have another one ear. We have very, so the songs for the same album are all over the place. They are not sorted by album, it's sorted by name. So what we have to check here is to know, because we want to group the item by albums, is to check, do we already have this album? So do we have a key, which is the song album title, this value here? If we don't, we will create a new object, which is one album, okay? Not to be confused with this one, which is albums with an S. So this one will be all the albums, but here we have an object for one album, and this album will have, um, Yeah, we will use this object, which is empty at this time, but we will put it in our albums uh, objects with the key being the, the song album title, which is here. And we put our empty objects here. This object can be, will be populated later, but it's already placed in our list of albums here. And we will do the same, place the SA album, the simple array album inside the other object, object that will be the album sorted by year. And to sort the album by year, we will use as a key the year, but we because we have different albums for the same year. So 1963, for example, 64, we have more than one. We will put a second, um, criteria for the sorting, which will be the song, the, the title of the album. This will not, not be displayed, but it will be used to sort the items by year and album. If I would have the month of the, the, the publishing of the album, we could have something that would be more 
chronological, but uh, that's a way here just to have this not random, but being year then album name. And we put this album object, which is still empty inside this um, associative array. Then in our album, uh, which is this year. So this is the designation of our album. So albums with the key, with the album title, we will add an item in this album that will be by the song track number. And we will put this here as the song, the song object that we built here. We will put it inside our album um, uh, object. So the track number is what we have here. So it starts with something which is the number 13. Later, we will have the number one to 12, but first, the first one we have is 13. So we put it here in the array albums. In fact, we have two arrays, with something we have not seen before here. We, as you see here, we have two references, two keys. So in the album of the key album title, we will go inside the item, which is the track number, okay? Yeah, nested arrays, you know, suddenly it, it, it's a lot more complicated, but it's very powerful. It's, it's, it's called two-dimensional array in the, the way to describe it. Okay, so, um, and we will see here what we get. And so we will see here the dialog box for every line. So it will start with a day in a life, our day's night, and then we'll see the album being created. And we will see that at first we have for Sergeant Pepper, we have song number 13. For our day's night, song number one. For a taste of honey on Please Please Me, Etc. And at some point, we will see that some album will start having two songs. For this one here, we have a second song. So we have number two and three. And at the end, we will have all the songs for all the albums, but we get them one at a time in our text file. And that's what we have to do in this case, because we receive a text file that is not sorted the way we would maybe prefer to have this sorted by albums, but that's the way it is. But we can build our objects by adding items as we get it. And in the end, if we skip this and just go here, we will have all the item, all the songs for all the albums. And we have, will have all this now in this album by year. We will have all these keys here. So 63 to 70. When there are two albums for the same year, we have the alphabetical order of the titles as a sort of sorting criteria. So that's what we will use now to loop inside the collection by year, because the end result that we have here is a list by year. So we will use the for loop here by looping the albums by year, the first object that we created here at the beginning, and that I will just close this one here, and that we populated here. So we parse this array and it will return one at a time, every album in the year name order, and it will return the key year. You know what, so for, John, let me, yeah. let me interrupt you just for one minute here, because after spending hundreds of hours being like this with Maestrith coding, and he'll get into three and four levels deep of like an A, B, and C, and a C, D, and E, and E. I mean, he goes so deep with letters. I don't know how he mentally keeps track of it. It's to me crazy, uh, but yeah. this is where using good name, a good naming convention to, to remember what's what really, really is beneficial. Some programmers are able to remember what's in A and what's in B and what's in Z, but I, I give very long name uh, <laughs> and I'm using cut and paste always because I do not retype. I always cut and paste my long names, but I that's my way of writing. I'm very... Uh, 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 verbose in the way I code. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the Fair album enough. here. So for this album, we will build a line here that will be the title of the album. It is this line here with the three dashes here. So the album one 
Okay, here the album title, I'm taking it from uh, the first track of the album. I could put any number here because I'm using one of the tracks to get the album name because the album name is part of each song. It is repeated for each song here. So I'm taking the first one and say that is the album name. And from the same track, I'm using the year because every album song has the same year. So it's not um, what's the name of database uh, theory, which is something that is very clean. That is um, um, the three, third form something. I don't know if someone has database knowledge. So it's not a, a, flat, a, a, a fully um, uh, flat file well form structure, data structure, because we have repetition. But yep. what I'll do, I'll, I'll use just the first one here to get the album name and the year. And then for each tracks inside this one album here, so for each track, I will get the song object that I will use to retrieve the name, the track, which is my key, the, the name of the song, the duration of the song that I'm just processing to turn it from um, number of seconds to number of minutes and remaining seconds. And that's the lines that we built here. And at the end, all this is accumulated in this uh, string variable. And in the end, I'm putting this variable in the clipboard. So just hoping that it will still work. I will delete this and run this script here. So we get the list of album. Then a the question, uh, do I want to copy the collection to the clipboard? Yes. And I will paste it here. And we have here our list of albums and songs formatted the way we want. And we, of course, can modify it to change the format, the order. We can build a, a different index if we want to sort, sort by uh, all the, by uh, duration or anything that we want to, to sort by. All we, what we would have to do is to add another index here and to populate this index when we read every new album, for example, or every, every new uh, key that will be added to this, uh, to this uh, object. So uh, if you're not familiar with programming, this is big stuff. But uh, if you take it piece by piece, uh, it's something that can make you uh, do very interesting things with uh, your auto add key and things similar that what could be done with uh, C++ or uh, Visual Basic, or it's kind of good, good tools to work with to build something that is very, um, very powerful. The other thing I, I want to point out, because I've, I've worked with them enough to beat my head against the wall long enough to, uh, Jean, sorry, can you share your, keep your screens yeah. being shared? Because I want to have an example in front of you there was in this example, sometimes like you see him declaring the objects on line three and four outside the loop. And then at other times, you know, he's, he's using it inside the loop. And this is just one of those things. Think very carefully about what you're doing because often people will put the declaring of the object inside the loop and they end up recreating that object over and over. And they're wondering why there's only one thing in it. It's because you've just, you've had that, you got the declaring of the object inside your loop and you keep yeah. starting over from scratch, right? Yeah, and then it's important to understand that. This is a kind of scratch pad where you build an item and when the item is ready, you store it here in another object. So yeah, so good this point. is, yeah, so it's the same object, but yeah, it is a new object each it's time a, you use yeah, the it's dynamic, object command, right. it becomes a new, a new location in your memory that will hold this information. And what you see here, you say that for this object that is at this address here, put this address in my array here. And when we loop to the next line, we create a new object at a new address that will be stored again here with a different address. So it's not always the same thing here. It's always, it's just a kind of way to prepare our object and then store it somewhere. We need to store it somewhere because it would be overwritten each time if we, win, if we were not using this command here to create a new object. Uh, and then just so I'm 
um, correct. Uh, Ali mentioned uh, there's no easy way. There's no has key for a value, right? There's no way to easily see. You have to loop over all the values to search for a given thing. That's correct, right? Yeah, you can. Uh, you can as key is only for the key, not for the value. So you yeah. would have to. Yes, you would have to loop every item to find a, an object. Yeah, to find an object that contains something. Yeah. I could oh, give you an God. example here. I referred earlier to the search tool inside Quick Access Pop-Up. So what it does here, it will parse every object in every menu and submenu because there's a structure here and return for each object that are found, those that, and in what menu it was found. But you have to parse. That's something you have to do. But it can be very quick uh, to do it that. The other thing I would add is, I wish we had a good example of it, is when you take the exact same thing that's not written leveraging objects and you convert it to using objects and storing things, your code becomes so much easier to maintain and to learn and study once, once you understand objects, right? It's so much simpler to, to work with. It's it's hard to explain. Um, and to reuse and to reuse your your yeah. values in different contexts, but without having to rewrite everything or to recreate all the, the variables separately. Cool. Does anyone else have any other questions or anything? Going once, going twice. Thank you, John. That was a, a good, I think that, and I know you'll, you'll give us that file, but I think at least it's something similar, not exactly that one. Um, is on the forum somewhere, right? I've seen, I remember, oh, wait a minute. Was that your CSV buddy? Is that where I played with that? Or that was from years ago. Anyway, I know I've worked on that example with the the Beatles um, data file somewhere. Okay, on the forum. I, I, I use this file when I created ob, uh, object to CSV. So I have a library yeah. that I put on the forum that takes a CSV file and okay, converts that's... it to an object. I didn't go into that today, but uh, that's no, I know. Yeah. To make it simpler to process a text file into an object uh, structure, uh, so you can find it. I can give you the address for that if you. If you yes. No, it. I just remembered I had worked. I'd seen that data before, and, I, I, and the example was this: the same list of Beatles songs. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, awesome. All right. So, if it, I mean, if anyone has any questions about objects, jump in here. Or if you have other questions without a hockey that you're working on and you're trying to to solve, um, we're fine with that too. Or if you want to show something cool you've worked on lately. I have some interesting, okay, Dimitri, let's see it, man. Yep, there's time. Good evening. Um, yeah, I've, uh, I'm currently um, learning a lot about uh, the V2 auto version of yeah. and I I made a, a small script to see how how well it worked and I actually copied a nice program. I I'll show you share. So you'll probably all know it. I copied Notepad. Just to to see, uh, and it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, exercise to see how you can copy all functionalities. And yeah, it was a nice exercise to learn about uh, the new ways to create uh, GUIs uh, in the, uh, the second version of AutoHotKey. The, the same, I even added that you could copy, cut, uh, or uh, replace something. Uh, I really try to, to copy the exact look of uh, the original uh, notepad. And yeah, it's you're learning a lot by doing it. And trying to mimic it exactly like it is. The good news is, is then you can sell it later. Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding, being sarcastic. The, there was one problem. Uh, uh, Notepad has a, 
has a copyright on it. So. <laughs> So how big is it when it's compiled compared to the re regular Notepad? <laughs> Excuse me. If you compile it, how big of a file is it? Uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I, I'm probably not much bigger than the HK file itself, right? I mean, it's. Yeah, but I have no idea how large Notepad is. Well, we can figure that out. But yeah, that's very cool, man. And actually, uh, the version two has an example, some kind of an editor. So I I copied that and I tried to uh, improve it with uh, with adding functionalities. And uh, it's a very nice exercise if you just want to learn something. And then another thing, I am. Uh, I used to uh, code a lot with Arca Studio, but uh, it didn't add any uh, syntax helper for the version two of AutoHotKey. So now, now I, uh, I, uh, I'm working with the VS Code, and I'm kind of amazed about the functionalities. And I know that uh, Joe was amazed in. Uh, uh, AHK Studio that it, it could pinpoint your uh, variables in the syntax helper. Yes. Yeah. But with uh, VS Code, you can do even more. For example, I've created here a custom uh, function, and if I try to use it. It gives me here. Indeed, also the indi indication of uh, what uh, parameter you are using. Yeah. You can even define uh, extra help text just for that power parameter. So I can type something in it, and if I press a comma, it switches to the, to the second uh, text for the second parameter. Yeah, I mean, Studio does that, though, but, but what's what was different about you're saying that you can define it is that what you're saying studio also does it yeah but anyway still it's awesome i mean that's where you know with the one thing i was gonna say when jean's using site which is uh, i've used i still use it right it's a great editor uh is the auto assisting with studio and in um vs code does it as well of typing your variable names and it auto populates for you that was and, and i think there is a plugin in Sight that you can get it to do that but it's uh it's very helpful. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and, and for those that um, Dimitri is mentioning several things of V2, uh, the last month's webinar, Dimitri led us on you know some of the learnings of V2. So uh, if you haven't watched that video and interested in V2, uh, check out that webinar. Yes. Yeah, and I'm also kind of hard working on the converter. And it's actually uh, going cool. quite, quite well. Except if I need to handle uh, GUIs, it's kind of difficult to handle the, the yeah. events. That's a headache for me. Uh, I have still no idea how what's the best way to handle it because yeah, it does change a lot. And you could do several things, and some things work well, but. Yeah, in some situations, it, it will always fail. So not sure if, if I manage to, to convert that perfectly or just accept that it will generate errors that the user will need to fix it himself. Um, that's maybe also a possibility. Yeah. And um, I've also, there is now an extension for uh, the AutoHotKey V2, that's AutoHotKey 2 language support. It was used to, they, they said it's a great extension, but it's all in Chinese, the, the, the comments. But I actually uh, just uh, copied the files and translated it with uh, uh, Google Translate. And I asked uh, the creator of it to, to update it. So uh, that's, that's not, not man. Nice. 
the only disadvantage that uh, some of the explanations are a little bit too large for normal indications in the editor. So um, if somebody has time, he can <laughs> he can make it a little bit smaller and more compact. Incidentally, we um it's been I don't know maybe five months now somewhere in there. We did a, a webinar on VS Code as well and how to use it without a hotkey. And it, it is a solid editor. And uh, Isaiah's or Raprex showed us how to integrate with Git, and it was mind-boggling awesome, especially if you work with other people. It's a, it's a must-have. Yeah, it's true, but it takes time to, to get to true. understand it, uh, like any editor. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, the advantage is that it's used by a lot of people, and then they fine-tune it more and more, so... Yeah, you have more support on it than other, maybe, auto-hotkey editors that, that aren't used by tons of people. Cool. Okay. But I'm uh, learning a lot about uh, the version 2 of AutoHotkey and I like it more and more because it's way more it's consistent, consistent yeah. written than, than the version 1. But it's indeed a question if you have a large script that is working on your company, will you take the time to, to convert it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, incidentally, uh, in our office hours, I think I saw Tom on here. I don't see him now from Tab Nation. We uh, we had office hours on Friday. We're trying to do them, you know, every Friday at uh, I think it's eleven Eastern time. Uh, but anyway, we we were discussing about version two and should we start putting a V one V two like at the top of our scripts because uh, V two is not backwards compatible. And things are going to break and. Um, I had happened to be talking to Tink about it before, so he joined us on the call. And it took a while. It's near the end of the video. But uh, one thing they're thinking about doing is, you know, A, kind of like we mentioned, you know, citing V1, written for V1 or V2 in the script, but really kind of more having either a different subforum where to post them or possibly a whole new forum, which I think in a lot of ways would people would not like, but at the same time, it would really help i personally that's that's what i would vote for is just make it a different forum and and it's so much e easier for to make sure people are using you know posting in the right place because otherwise i think people are going to get very confused that's true but i i think uh it will be logical that everybody will switch to version two because i think uh uh the more high advanced programmers, I think they will all go to, to version two because yeah, yeah, it's, I, it's only natural. <laughs> and the rest will probably follow because, yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna completely disagree with you, Dimitri, but to me, the fundamental thing that most people come into auto hockey is they're not programmers, right? They're doing simple things. Mm -hmm. And it's what brought me into auto hockey was I didn't have to learn, you know, how to declare my variables and learn all this, what I felt was arbitrary stuff. Uh, and it was simple to get going. And now suddenly it's, it's not as easy to start on, I think. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not saying it, it shouldn't happen. I'm just saying that's why I'm not as a big of a believer as you are, that, that people are just going to switch, right? Um, that's true. Uh, it too is less forgiving. Well, and yeah, which which does have its pros. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, when I started learning Python, I didn't like I had only one way to do stuff and that it was a, a space mattered, you know, on the indentures and stuff. And then I realized over time it actually is a better thing. Now, I'm glad... Auto hockey is not case sensitive because that drove me insane. But there's some real strengths in in having restrictions. It's just when you go to get started in them, it's actually a negative, right? It's it's harder. Uh, so yeah, it, it'll be interesting. Yeah. 
Awesome. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to share or anything they're working on and do anything cool? Joe, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, I have your screen capture utility, some, some of the older source code, mm -hmm. and I wanted to compile it and it won't compile. Is, do you have any memory of it having code that would make it not compile? I don't think I've ever had a script that can't compile. I don't, I don't know what that even means, honestly. So, okay. so no. All right. I'll have to fool around with this more. The, the only thing I can think of off the top of my head was at one point that code, I was using some stuff from Jackie using Tesseract. Is that what it's called, Jackie? Um, for the object, for the, sorry, for the uh, OCR. OCR, yeah, and that but, would but still that shouldn't stop it from compiling because it's okay. an external thing. So I'm not sure if you're still using the Tesseract or the built-in one. No, I don't use it anymore. Tesseract, no, I, I use the Windows 10 OCR because it's so fast and accurate. It's it's amazing. Exactly. So yeah. The only no, sorry, reason I... I have for not always using that in my code is if people abroad is using it because you actually need the English uh, language well, installed on your Windows version. The, the new version we have, Jackie, allows the person to choose their language. Um, yeah. You know, and, and it is pretty, we, we added that. I'm like, that is really badass that you can now say, what what is my native language? And it'll, it'll, I think going, it, we gave the URL to go get it if you don't have it. Um, it yeah, um, I mean, it, still, it depends on whichever type of software you're doing. But yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah, I um, said it wrong. It does compile, but it doesn't work. Um, so that's, that's, that's different. different but when I hold the Windows key and draw, the yellow box goes on the screen and then nothing happens after I let go. So. Um, the first thing that pops in my mind on that is to make sure you're compiling it with a 32-bit version, and not 64-bit, because um, the GDI library that I was using at the time, and I think there's a newer one, was only 32-bit compatible, and and that was an easy break where it would, it would break it. Ah, okay. So how, how do I know what compiler I have, 32 or 64? Well, you, you have both, but you just got to, and Jackie is better suited to tell you how to force it to compile um, with the 32. It depends. I don't compile much anymore, so I'm not sure which version uh, the compiler is on or what options you have in the GUI and stuff like that. But yeah, depending on whichever version of out of hotkey you chose when you're installed, um, it would compile with that firsthand, but I do believe you actually have the option to choose a different um, yeah. uh, auto hotkey bin version. I see in my auto hotkey folder, I have auto hotkey exe and then an A32 exe, a U32 exe, and a U64 exe. Well, so let, let me ask you this. Actually, if you run the, the compiling GUI, don't you have a few options in there? No, I, I just right click on the AHK file and then tell it to compile it. Yeah, okay. Then you wouldn't have the option because then it actually uses the uh, command line parameters to do it. But if you actually run the uh, HK to exit uh, exe, then you would see the GUI for compiling and be able to choose a few options. Yeah, yeah. And you can add icons and other things. Yeah. I did not know AutoHockey had a GUI. It only has it for the actual compiler. It should be in your AutoHockey uh, library or oh, folder. Okay, there's an AHK2EXE in the compiler yeah. folder. If you double click that, you'll, you'll get the GUI for compiling. Okay, I did not know oh. about that and I'm looking at it now, thank you. Yeah, well, Jackie, why don't you, if you want, why don't you share your screen and just pull it up just so people can see it if they're not familiar with this. Because the vast majority of people do like Ben says is when you go to pile, you just right click and say compile and you're done and everything works. And it's amazing because if you've ever tried to compile in other languages, you have no idea. It's so, it could be so hard. It's, it's, it's so easy without a hockey. It's amazing. 99% of the time. Yeah. So uh, this is as simple as gets. Uh, I don't have the newest version of our hotkey currently, but yeah. Uh, our hotkey exe. 
there. Uh, this is how it looked in version 1.130.03. And I here on the base file, the bin file, I have quite a few installed as you can see, because I have different types of software where I use different versions and I don't want to change the actual auto hotkey version because some of them do better in um, virus total than others. So I have other options of which versions I use. So yeah, choose the 62-bit or 32-bit bin file that you want to use. I'm not and sure if impress it this way anymore. Yeah, and the impress can help uh, help kind of protect it to some degree, but it, it um, does a very simple job of actually compressing the exit, which mm, only removes the um, plain text version from the end of the file. That's mostly what it does. It of course compresses the exit a little bit, but it doesn't really do much for protecting it. Yeah, and I have a video where I show how to use AutoHotkey H for uh, a better um, uh, protection, for lack of a better term. Yeah, yeah, we we had some good stuff with Auto uh, Hotkey. It yeah, where he explained the stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the webinar. He walks through how to compile with AutoHotkey H and other stuff. Right, we show him multi-threading. AutoHotkey H does some amazing stuff. Tank has looked deep into it, and he said he would have no problem using it as a you know source code for doing stuff. So. Uh, I, I feel good feelings. But he spent, I'd say, like, what, like 20, 30 minutes showing how to compile with AutoHockey H. And then I think I asked a question, well, what, what if I don't care about the password? What if I just let it auto-generate it? He's like, oh, you basically come to this thing and you click a button and it's done. And it was so much easier. And I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, that's all. Yeah, but if you wanted to set a specific custom um, um, yeah. compilation password, um, yeah. Yeah, then, it's much more complex. But then if you have it, you could decode it. You can go back in and unpack it and, you know, get your, your source code. Without it, you, it's gone. So just make sure you keep your source code. Yeah, but, but again, if you said your unique password one time, uh, it, it's, an, it's half an hour of your time. And then compiling right. with that version of H would, uh, for the most part, keep your source code. That's much more protected. And yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, Jackie, but it, I mean, it's been quite a while since we did it. But I, I, it didn't dawn on me, but I think he used VS Code as the editor. Is that right? Or Visual Studio, maybe? Uh, Visual Studio, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, Ben, that'd be my first thing I would check. Is uh, I just did it with the 32-bit Unicode, and it worked. Oh, great. Awesome. So thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hellbent is working on some additions to, to my version, and that's we're going to bring them in and have where you can uh, type text, change the zoom level, and draw like an arrow in a box and stuff. Okay. Yep. I figured out a clever uh, zoom solution. I don't know if you want me to demonstrate it or not. If you want to, it's fine. Uh, let me uh, share the screen screen here. Just remember, anything you share is, you know, going to be out there. Yeah. So um, this is my work computer. So I just ran it. Didn't I run it? No, there it is there. Okay. So now it should be running. There it is. And I should be able to take a screenshot. And um, you're familiar with that. And I, if I press the Z key, that makes it zoomable. Um, and that works great for me and, uh, resizable too. So there's sometimes I'm working on something late at night and I want to zoom in while I'm copying it down. Uh, so, and you're probably one scratching your head. How did I figure that out? How to do that? And I'll tell you, I cheated and I'm using, I turn on the toolbar that's the one limitation of this thing is you can't drag the window oh. see control see control alt c 
Oh, there we go. I'm using Irfan View. In frame view, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a really old tool. It's great. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I always thought it was Infran, but it's Irfan. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I'm sure I pronounced it incorrectly, but uh, anyway, yeah, I've been so, using it forever. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if you want to create icons, text, you can make sorry. it so the frame doesn't show up. Cool. So the trick was after I do this and then I hit the V, I had to make sure that it put the new window in the exact location as the old one. Yeah. And I don't know why it's right. opening up this size. That's right. It normally just comes right to the same size, but uh, I don't know if I have to reload this or what. I can't do that, can I? But uh, yeah, it should. When I hit the same. Yeah, the window is in the exact same place. You can see that you know lines are pretty much straight mm -hmm. lined up. A little bit off there, but um, what other? I made a couple other enhancements to it. Let me open up the source code. Um, as long as you guys are looking for content for your video. Um, How did you have made it zoomable? Couldn't it actually be an idea of just grabbing the entire screen and only showing a small GUI around the uh, area you actually copied? So you could zoom in and out and move the image to the side and stuff like that. I, I'm missing what you're saying. You're saying it's just now that you can actually zoom it. Why yeah. keep it to the selected area? It's it's fine and, and nice. You you have frame around something, but if you're actually zoomed out instead of having black borders there, if you have they grabbed the entire screen, um, it, it was just an idea. So you're saying when I go to do it, just grab. Oops grab the entire screen and i hate that sometimes that window pops up it's yeah just, yeah in this uh, case you're yeah. you're doing it with the selected area of course and right now when you zoom it you you then have access to much more information but if you had scaled it and uh, just shown the area that fit uh, the box Here's your white jackie yeah yeah so, so yeah, if, if it becomes zoomable, people would probably expect that they could also zoom out on it. Right. Yeah, and True. by getting the entire area, then that, and you're just using the frame to help say, what am I looking at? That yeah. would take care of that. Yeah. yeah. So that's up to the user, really. They could just zoom, uh, snap, take a snapshot of the entire window. Yeah. Right. They just do that. Now they have, I don't know what it did there. Okay, the other uh, features I added on it, so I added control space, which is a, a auto hotkey I'm already using that just turn off the always on top ability because I may not want that window in front of everything. It may get annoying after a while, but I still may need it. So see, I can have it always on top there and then I can toggle it off. Yeah, um, see, I, it, to me, and I've talked to... Um, Jackie about this some and John actually on the side some. When you start adding a lot of different functionality, tools become so complex that it becomes really hard to use, you know, to start learning and use. So I'm very hesitant to add new functionality just because it just starts getting it so complex that it just, you know, people don't want to use it. Right. Yeah, and then you need small buttons on there and because people don't remember all the hotkeys right. that you chose and or you want to give them options of changing the keys themselves or so yeah, it, it becomes a, a great thing for you to change for your needs, but if Joe wants to keep it straight and simple, yeah, yeah, not adding too much to it uh, might be a good way of keeping it. How often do you build things for other people instead of just for yourself? Almost never. <laughs> you mostly build them for yourself, you're saying? Oh, yeah. The 99% of the stuff I build is just for myself. Right. So making it usable. I mean, I don't have any menus in my application that says there's a Zoom feature. I just happen to remember the Z is Zoom. Yeah. 
but but and I'm perfectly okay for doing stuff for yourself, doing it to go crazy, right? Yeah. Anything I make that's out there for everybody, that's what I keep super simple. Right, right. I agree with that. I don't, yeah, that's completely. Um, yeah. yeah, and I'm not yeah. knocking what you're doing, right? I, I'm just clarifying because before you were asking me to add this stuff, and I'm like, you know, you know, I'm I don't want to add more stuff to something I already have out there just because it's it's simple to use, and that was the whole point, right? Is it does the core. But um, I, I always did want to be able to draw like an arrow and the zooming is nice. It, you know, it, it, I, I get that, especially if it's simple. Um, control scroll, right, would, is, is very intuitive for most people. So um, that's a slam dunk. Yeah, yeah and depending on how you added the functionality, Ben, um, it might be a good idea for you to make it uh, modular. So, so oh. the functionality that you add is actually um, kept individual and uh, modular. So if Joe comes with a great update someday, uh, you don't have to build all of your uh, modifications once more. I had planned that, but Joe told me he was done on that version. Yeah, is he right, probably Joe? is. But then someone comes and says, hey, don't you want to have speech commands i don't know whatever someday he does something weird yeah yeah didn't it record a five second video instead of an image who knows whatever it might be right here's the source code i use in case you want to keep that in your video i'll just put it on the screen there and i'll scroll a little bit and that's pretty you, much all. is it on the forum I don't know where the forum is. Oh, well, I mean, because that, that's where all the source code I had also. I thought that's where you were grabbing it from. But yeah, on the um, the forum, that's where mine, and it's, see, I used to have a lot more functionality, like instantly uploading to um, to a, a, what the hell is it called? Like a paste in kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and a couple of things. And I removed some functionalities because I'm like, you know, it's just extra and not many people used it, but yeah, the, the initial source code is up there. Uh, on the there forum. was one for email. Yeah, that's still yeah, no in there, mainly because I use it. <laughs> right. But that one yeah. probably could get removed because I'm not sure how often people really use it. Um, I, I personally use it somewhat frequently, but. The OCR, that is a great ad. I'm so glad of that. And the translation for Google Translate that you can pick your languages. and for Because I know people, my counterparts at TI all across the, the world, they would be doing stuff, but they don't speak English natively. And something like this really helps. With your Zoom um, functionality where you load it into uh if or whatever um yeah. do it actually change some of the ocr functionality or so if you zoom into an area will it only ocr that new visible area or will it still ocr the entire image so when i basically i am launching earth and view and passing it what's in the clipboard and then I'm killing the instance of the capture. So it's now an urban view window. It's it's not running auto hotkey anymore at that point. It won't respond to any of the auto hotkey commands for that application. Mm -hmm. But you then so would no, just re no GUI. There's no OCR at that point. Well, the, I mean, there because you relaunched the, the screen clipping scripts, correct? And he could clean screen he could screen clip the ifran view window to right. get OCR running once again. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I could yeah, I could do that. Yeah. So I'm just saying it's like you the second you switch over, you're restarting your screen clipping tool, which then you could just use the screen clipping on the infrant view zoomed in and make it easier, yeah. especially if the words are kind of close together and you want certain things, that would be a quick way to take care of that. Yeah, uh, you didn't. Your version didn't have an OCR after the windows already clipped, did you? Yeah, it does. Well, no, 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 because it's. I it's view them as clip, very right? separate, you know, things. It's really two different tools, honestly. 
Yeah, so there it does the OCR and do the clip. But after I have the clip, there's you have to you'd have to clip it again. Um, yeah, but yeah. now zoom in. Make that where you can zoom in on it. Okay, I'll zoom in on it and resize it, and now and now just get a sub part of it. I could do that right there. Right. I should get a new right. folder. I do down here. Yep. Yep. Now, there's another quirk about this application is when I'm sharing my screen. Um, I wrote notes in here. If I'm in like teams and I'm sharing my screen, I can't finish the capture. When I when I let go of my Windows key, it's still stuck. It doesn't realize I've released and I want to finish the capture. So it's working right now. But when I'm in, what's it say? Yeah, it just said sharing the screen, but I think it's in Teams. Yeah, when I'm sharing my screen and I start a capture, it will not complete a capture. Well, it, my first guess would be Teams has a hotkey associated with what you're trying to use. Well, I'm just using the Windows key. I'm just using Windows and drag. Yeah. But, so but what I did, the if I made key, it, if I depending it, on whichever one of your keys you're using, oh. might be a functional key in, in that screen sharing tool you're using. Right. And that will overrule whatever you're doing. The, the other thing I would, the first thing I would, the very first thing I would do, because it's so easy, is launch the screen clipping tool as an admin, you know, raise the level to an admin okay. and see if that fixes it. And if that doesn't fix it, my second one is that there's just a hotkey in the other tool that you're using that's pri taking priority to it. Yeah, but there's no, once you start this, there's no hotkey firing when I go of the Windows key. It's it's the let go that stops. It'll do this and then my mouth is stuck. Even when I'm not holding the Windows key anymore, I just get this all over the screen. It doesn't detect the mouse release is the what it doesn't detect. So I just so made the way that auto hotkey actually detects the mouse release, that's what's being interrupted. Yeah. Not um, like not whatever your screen right. sharing tool is or any other program uh, that does whatever is happening there will interrupt that from happening. I've seen it in many other programs before where a mouse action will uh, seem to get stuck in that manner. Yeah. So I just added a key so it detects the enter key, then it, it finishes the capture. Just gives me a, oh. a back, you know, an additional way. Yeah. So I would also just did you try changing it from the Windows key to a different key? Uh, they did program that for another purpose, which is if I'm running this utility on a remote desktop, I don't have access to the Windows key. So I need a secondary key because, you know, the Windows key doesn't usually work on a remote desktop. Um, I think it does. I think it's just that your 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 local computer eats it up. Right. Yeah. Well, same thing. Right. It's well, you, you, can't, you can't tap the Windows key and have a remote desktop have its start menu pop up. You, you, you can if you if you do it right. Right. If you um, you can make sure you still send it. It might be a setting in, in the remote desktop software, you're saying? No, no. You just have to make sure you also send it to that remote computer. You hit the key, this computer you're on, you know, eats it up and never gets sent to the other computer, right? Right. So, so how would you send it to the other computer? I can't pull it up right now. Well, I'm not going to say I'm going to solve it right now. I'm just saying you can figure out a way to still pass it through. Because okay. I used to do it all the time at TI, and and I could run everything. I, I just made it where, hey, if if uh, Citrix, if that window was active, um, it would send something different when I hit, you know, the Windows key or whatever, right? And it would actually send it remotely on that other computer. Okay. I'm sure there's okay. way. I'm sure there's way you could figure it out. Is my point, right? It's. Yeah, my point is you can have access to that remote Windows key. You just have to figure out how to actually get it to get triggered over there, right? It's through auto hotkey or through the 
sure. remote desktop software. No, 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 no. Through through Auto Hot. I mean, I did it with Auto Hotkey. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't like if, if I'm on a remote desktop and I want to reboot it, I can't hit control delete. I have to hit control and that interprets that as control delete. And then I get the you know the menu I, that pops up. What I did was I put a script on my remote computer that I could trigger easily, you know, and, and it would that script would reboot the computer for me. Um and like, let's say if you have Dropbox on both computers, right, have something locally monitoring that folder all the time on the remote computer, and then you can change the file on your computer and it will go trigger it on that computer, right? Because I've had it where I'd have to wait for someone to be in my office to go to my computer and reboot it for me because I, I couldn't go do stuff. And this that was one of my workarounds was like, all right, all right I'll, you know, I'll find a way to do it. Anyway, yeah, cool stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant to say, I don't know if there's anything in the chat you want to respond to, but I'm going to stop sharing. That's fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite, you know, I think it's my most downloaded script. It's, it's I wrote the thing years ago and, and, you know, and I never even looked at like the whole GDI library. I went through the GDI uh, library and pulled in, you know, what I had used manually, and I did it. it was really painstaking at the time, but um, and I I leveraged stuff from Maestrieth and from a couple other one people, and uh, and then I Frankensteined it together. You should have put some ads in there or something. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. We we're trying no the screen crafts. So you you'd also get an ad. Yeah. No, that would probably <laughs> not make it very popular. But yeah. 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 Well, I, at least I the, too, so. the current version, what I finally did, Jackie, after all those years was when you use the screen clipping in the email, because you can, um, is that the one? I think it, it adds a little signature to say this was done by this and it has a link to the, the tool, you know, or something. Well, thank you, thank you, John, for, for covering objects. That was awesome. I hope people understand the the value of you know what you covered there it it takes a while to get used to them and to program it once you do it's worth it um like we said next webinar is going to be on using functions creating your own functions and using functions and then um jean's going to lead us the month after that on uh using classes which is still it's funny when raptor x and i were discussing classes and uh, and and he's like what is that he's like that's objects i'm like no classes and he's like no that's that's objects and for him, because he uses objects so deeply, it, because it really is still just an object, just a, a, a little deeper usage of it. Uh, uh, but he wasn't quite understanding where I was going with it. But um, hopefully, John will, uh, not hopefully, I know he'll do a great job. It's I've used them. And I know everyone I talk to is like, oh, after you learn functions, that's your next go-to to learn. And I always take the, the way out of like, you know, I don't write complex things, and I also don't really program in GUIs. And I think those two things, if you're writing complex things and working with other people, especially passing, you know, values, you can compartmentalize your stuff. And I forget there's a programming term for that where you you don't make it accessible. What is it, Jackie? Oh, um, well, it's scope, but it, I no, um, it's but it's 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 it really does have to do with scope. But I think there's another term that they use where you're local protecting and local it. or. Yeah, it's still, that's still the concept. This was a, a, a different term. I, anyway, I could be wrong, but yeah. um, it, it is when you're, you know, you're doing stuff in other languages or other people, they only have access to certain things. I know that's still all scope, but I thought there was another term for it that uh, it's not polymorphism, is it? Is, is, is that something different? Um, anyway, the other one, though, is when you program with, with GUIs, that's where I really see, I've seen Maester do it so many times of you're creating multiple instances of the same thing and reusing it. And the structure it gives you the ability to recreate a new version kind of the same thing, uh, like a template, right? And, and that happens a lot. It would make a lot of sense for uh, Sean's um, example today, if you actually had multiple files of uh, artists uh, uh, songs or whatever and he actually wanted to be able to continuously make these um, 
files where it was structured differently. A class would be a good example of always being able to convert um, complex files like this in a specific oh. format. Okay, well, awesome. We're, we're right at the, the end of the second hour. But that was awesome. Thank you again, John. Oh, and before I forget, I'll put a link in the, um, the email I sent out with the resources. But as um, Jean mentioned, I think mentioned earlier, uh, QAP, Quick Access Pop-Up, is now donationware kind of stuff. He's, he's changed it back from being a paid thing to being just accepting donations. It's an amazing tool. It's written in auto hotkey. Not that that matters, but it, I use it dozens, if not hundreds of times a day. It's a great tool. Check it out. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Yep. Bye. See you soon. Bye.